thank you. One thing you know, one thing that Shannon does not forget, I'm trying to train her, she won't forget my phone number. <laughs> and I keep on going to these events. And Shannon calls, Shannon emails. Now you've got my daughter Ashley's email and her phone number. So between the two of you, I, I keep pretty, pretty busy. I almost feel like standing over here. Is this all right? So I can see everybody? First of all, thank all of you for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. I really do. And it, it, this is such a great organization, and just showing up, as you've already been told, you know, really makes this whole thing a, a, a winning night. And what happened, somebody asked me when we were getting our pictures taken, if this was my house. No, but I am the garden. <laughs> and, and what have you. So, but again, thanks so much for, for coming out. And thanks for all that you've done and all that you are going to do for this great, great organization. You know, I, I go out and speak quite a bit across the country. I did radio for, for many, many years. I got out in 2009, and I've been doing a lot of, a lot of speaking since then on, on different issues, uh, whether it's uh, political issues or child issues. And also, uh, with Alzheimer's, has kept me has kept me quite busy. And I will tell you, I'd much rather be with organizations such as this and helping raise money for organizations like this to make a difference than getting caught up in the political effort all of the time. Uh, because you know, things happen when organizations like this come together to really go out and, and help people. All of you know that my father uh, had this terrible, terrible disease called Alzheimer's. We all know that 1994. In fact, next year will be the 10th anniversary, or 20th anniversary, when he wrote the letter to the nation telling us that he had come down with Alzheimer's disease. And it, we, it's interesting, we all have our, our crosses to bear and what have you, and, and people always ask me, what was the greatest time you had with your father? And You know, it wasn't the political years. I, I remember the years with my father, those years growing up with my dad, and, and going out to the ranch with my father, and swimming with my father, and, and shooting you know, shooting ground squirrels with lead-filled bullets with my father. <laughs> when you could. I remember, you know, chopping firewood. I was the I was the young man who actually bought him his first chainsaw. And the oak trees at San Ynez have not forgiven me since. So, hello, have not forgiven me since. But, you know, I, I remember those days, and I think that's important that that we really think about those days, those moments we had with our loved ones who had this terrible disease, those moments that we really enjoyed being with them and not look at the moments so much they're into today. And, and as I, I think back about those days, I, I remember growing up as a Beverly Hills kid, and by the way, I had a mother. A, a lot of people you know, refer to me as Ronald Reagan's son, but Jane Wyman was my mother. Uh, yeah, and uh, she had a pretty good career. In, in fact, I, I tell people, had they not adopted me into the family, they would have been nothing. <laughs> I mean, if Ronald Reagan and Jane Wyman don't adopt a child, they don't have a conservative one. So look at that. If you ever go out to adopt a child, we're all conservative. At least, at least I was. But my mom, many don't know, my mother was buried as a Dominican nun, third order. And I told somebody at a, at a Republican event the other night, I said, you don't understand this. You think Ronald Reagan's the big catch me out, but in heaven, my mother's two foot above it. Because no matter what, she was buried as a nun, he was buried as a politician. No matter how good he was. But I think back to being raised in, in Beverly Hills by, by my mom and my dad. And they, they were both born with a birth defect. They believed in something called the work ethic which was really not great for a child being raised in Beverly Hills because we really believed in rich kids' welfare. We believed because we lived in large houses with maids and cooks that really we should get everything we want given to us. Why should we have to work? Our parents didn't. They were actors. And that's how we kind of looked at it. And, and, and I remember when I wanted to buy my first bike, and actually buy my first bike, get my first bike given to me by my parents, they reminded me that if I really wanted that I needed to go out and get a job and I tried to explain to my parents that I was 10. And they tried to explain to me, yes, but with a bike you can get a job and I tried to explain to them what kind of job there isn't any available. They explained to me very simply, you can start delivering papers tomorrow. And so my mother actually made me sign a note and loaned me the money to get that bike because she felt that I needed to learn 
the work ethic before I learned anything else in my life. And I said to my mom and my dad, why are you making me sign a note to borrow money to buy a bike that every other child I know is getting one for free? And they said, you know something, because we build men, we don't build boys. And I said, what do you mean by that? So we have enough money to give you anything and everything you want, but we don't want you to be a 40-year-old child. We want you to be a 40-year-old man. So sign the note, take the money, and go deliver papers. So I started selling papers in front of Good Shepherd Church in Beverly Hills on Sunday mornings. And then I would give some of the profits to my mom and my dad when I got done selling papers at the end of the day. And ultimately I would pay back my mother and my dad for the, for the bike, for the money they loaned me. And I did say to my mother when I turned 40, however, that now we've done it your way for 40 years, it's time to turn over the money. <laughs> and my mother said, no, no, same deal, just get a job. And so that's kind of the way I was raised by, by my mother and by my father. In fact, we all were. And that's probably one of the most wonderful thing that they, in fact, taught all of us you know, growing up in, in the Reagan household, even though people thought it was another direction, that somehow you did get everything you wanted, they really made us work for everything that we, in fact, in fact had. And, and I have so many other problems going on in my life, and you read about that in my book, Twice Adopted, that I didn't realize how great my parents were until later on in life when I finally accepted what had happened to me uh, was something I could not stop. And when I finally came clean about these things to my parents in 1987, it really opened up my life to really look back and, and see how great they were and really see them as the parents they were and the things that they did for me. And be able to see my father for the things he did, not only for the family, but really did for so many other people. And, and that was probably the greatest eye-opening thing in my life when I finally decided to, in some ways, forgive my parents and quit blaming them. So often, what we do is we blame our parents for things that happen to us in our lives, and then we carry that with us for the rest of our lives, and then something of this nature hits, like Alzheimer's, and you forget to ever go forward and say, you know something? I forgive you for whatever you think or I think you've done to me, I love you. We forget to do that, and then we feel guilty during the period of time they, they are suffering Alzheimer's, and you sit back and say, I wish, I just wish I had. If I only would have, my gosh, why didn't I? I could stand up here tonight and say, I don't even think about that. Because some of the best relationships I ultimately had with my father is when he had Alzheimer's. I found out where he lived, where he was at and decided to meet my father where he was at instead of trying to make him where I was at. He wasn't ready for that, but he was ready to live where he was. And it was the same thing with my kids, Cameron and Ashley. Cameron and Ashley, I think kids are the greatest place to learn from when you're dealing with this kind of an issue. Young ones. Ashley was very young. Back in 1994, she was only 10 years old. And or 10, she was 12 years old, and, and, and Cameron wasn't much older than that. He was like 17. And getting together with their grandfather was, was, was really something because they would find where granddad was, and they would meet him there. Cameron would go into his office and take a, a book of Chinese off the, off the table, and, and he would sit there with his grandfather and look at Chinese lettering, and they would just giggle. And nobody would understand why they were giggling. And they were just having fun. Or, or, or Ashley would open up a picture book and just look at pictures with her grandfather. And they would smile and they would laugh. Because granddad was living where Ashley was. And Ashley was living where granddad was. And it was just wonderful to sit back and watch this and, and take it all in. And some of the things that Alzheimer's patients do makes us all kind of giggle like when you would give your dad a, or grandfather a card for Christmas or a card for his birthday and he would open it up and he would read the front of it he would read the inside of it he would turn it over and read the back side of it who produced it what year it was produced and when and where and then he would put it away in the envelope 
and three and a half minutes later he would open the envelope and we'd read it all over again. But we would allow him to know he was reading it for the first time. We wouldn't sit there and say, you've done that before. Don't do it again. We would be with him. We would enjoy it the second, third, fourth, and fifth time like we enjoyed it the first time he, in fact, read it. When we first knew that Alzheimer's was really taking my father was before 1991 or 1994. It was about 1991 or 1992. And we were worried about the media, in fact, finding out about our father. And that's one of the reasons he wrote the letter. There was a night that we were celebrating the birthday of my father, and, and Margaret Thatcher had come from London to, to be there to be supportive of my father. My father got up and, in fact, in front of about a thousand people, introduced Maggie Thatcher. And when he got all done and a standing ovation was given to Maggie Thatcher, my father reintroduced her again to another standing ovation. And everybody in the room knew then what was going on with my father, and we knew as a family that we had to get that story out. And what happens so often in our community is we're afraid to let that story out. We're afraid to let people know that in fact someone in the family might be ill with Alzheimer's because it has become the C word of this generation. We have to stop being afraid of talking about Alzheimer's. We have to start talking about Alzheimer's because we need to find a cure. We can't run away from it being in our families because there's so many thousands and thousands and millions and millions of families that are affected by this terrible disease each and every year. You know, the good news in America, we have every drug in the world to make us live longer. The bad news in America is that means most of us, that many of us, are going to get Alzheimer's disease. And somebody's going to have to take care of us. And we need to do something about that. And this is what this organization is doing. Somebody who's taking a step forward to help people, help caregivers, help others. One of the hardest things to do, and you all know it, is to have a loved one living in the home with this terrible disease. Sometimes it's so much worse than the caregiver that the one with Alzheimer's outlives the caregiver in the home. Now you have an organization here in Bakersfield that's saying, wait a minute, we're here for you. We are here to take in your loved one. We are here to be your helpmate, to take care of your loved one during the day so you can go out and do the business you need to do. You know, Nancy, didn't have a, an organization to, to send her husband to or my father to to take care of my father during the day. And, and the worry was, of course, in the world that we live in with cell phones and smartphones, there's no privacy and pictures would have been coming out all of the time about her husband. And Nancy's done everything in the world to protect her husband, my dad, from, from the media, what they would be saying about my father. And have said many in the media since they found out he had Alzheimer's disease. So Nancy had to sell the ranch. How many other people have to sell things that they have just to take care of the loved one at home? Nancy had to sell my father's pride and joy, Rancho del Cielo. In order to have the money to have the caregivers come into the home to take care of her husband and my father. And she had 24 hour a day help that was there at the house. The ranch was sold to Young America's Foundation. They have the ranch today up in San Ynez. And they do conferences up there on a regular basis of college kids, high school kids. I was the guest speaker at the opening of a high school conference just last Wednesday at Rancho Del Cielo, or at least the Ranch Center in Santa Barbara. It is exactly the way it was the last day my father set foot on that ranch. You see, when he left, he didn't know he wasn't going back. Didn't know at all. So the soap that was in the soap dish is still in the soap dish. The wood that he had cut with his chainsaw is still stacked outside the house. The wood that was in the fireplace is still in the fireplace. Everything is exactly the way it was when he left. And it has shown to thousands of people each and every year to help raise money for people to learn about the values of my father, the values he lived with, from the day he was born in Tampico, Illinois, above a bank, to Dixon, Illinois, to Eureka College, finally to California, governor, president, 
but never forgetting who he was, where he came from, and where he learned to be exactly who he was. He never forgot that. You see, I have found out over the years, and being with my father, that their mind may leave them, but their heart never leaves them. It is always there. It always recognizes, even if the mind and the lips do not work together. There would be many days when my father would just speak in gibberish, and you would look at him and try to find out where he was going, what he was thinking, and then you would speak to him because you could ultimately understand what he wanted to talk about. And I believe he ultimately understood exactly what he wanted to say. I didn't get frustrated. I wouldn't sit there and be frustrated and say, I don't understand you. I would understand it. When Ashley would go to visit him in his office, I remember one day around Christmas, my father was not having a great day at the office. It was a gibberish kind of day. And Ashley was there with me to visit her grandfather and have lunch. There was a piece of Christmas music later that was going to be brought in to entertain my father. And as we were leaving, and we weren't going to be there for the Christmas music, Ashley turned to give her grandpa a hug. My dad wrapped his arms around his granddaughter Ashley, hugged her, and with a twinkle in his eye, looked straight at me and said, you know why I hugged her, Michael? I said, no, Dad, why'd you hug her? Because she's a she. <laughs> and a second later, he was back speaking gibberish. And we were invited into that day to listen to the music. He had a special moment with Ashley, a special moment with Cameron. And I was lucky enough to be able to see that. And I was lucky enough to ultimately forgive myself and forgive my parents for things I went through as a child. It's not easy being green, growing up as a child with somebody who's famous. No matter what you do, it seems that people give credit to your parentage, not to you. You know, there's, there's things that every child and every actor or politician want, the spotlight. And usually children lose to politicians and actors. At least we found that out in our house. They're always looking for stardom. And so you find these out. Many of us in my day and age were sent to boarding schools as children. So I went to school with the Hope children and the Crosby children and, and what have you. And we would board at school and go to school on a Sunday night at 7 o'clock and come home every other Friday at 4 o'clock. I go to the ranch on Saturday with my father. 7 o'clock Sunday night, back at school for another two weeks. And that's the way I was raised. I remember people telling me how lucky I was because my parents were actors. And they would get picked up every day by their moms and their dads after school and taken home for dinner. And we would cry ourselves to sleep every night. But I remember driving out to the ranch one day with my father. I don't know if you know anybody like this, but my father was one of these people, if you asked him what time it was, he'd tell you how the watch was made. You know anybody like that? That's how my father was. He was a parable guy. He spoke in parables, not sound bites. So he really kind of watched your questions. And, and in fact, yeah, I, I hit him up. I was about eight years old, nine years old, and I, I said to my dad, Dad, I need a larger allowance. I was getting a dollar a week. Is that cheap? Yeah, how are you how are you to get along in Beverly Hills on a dollar a week when your best friends are the Hope kids and the Crosby kids and the Crawford kids? It is impossible. So I thought my parents should know this and I get more money. So I asked my dad for a larger allowance riding out to the ranch because at that time we was in Malibu. And for the next 35 minutes I hold I heard about the tax system in America. Now I had a choice, jump out of the car or listen, but I thought I'd listen because I thought at the end of it, there'd be more money. I heard how the government took 90 cents out of every dollar, the 10 cents that was left, he had to take care of his first wife, my mother, my sister Maureen, myself, his new wife Nancy, their new daughter Patty, their home, the cows, the horses, the ranch, the foreman. As we were driving to the ranch that day, I actually offered back half of my allowance to my father. <laughs> I felt so sorry for him. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, you don't have to do that, Michael. But when there's a president elected, it gives me a larger, you know, tax you know, decrease. It gives me a tax decrease. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a larger allowance. 
So I found myself early on really becoming very political. Didn't know Democrat from Republican, but I knew a larger allowance from lesser. And, uh, and it would be 1964, Lyndon Johnson would put through the Kennedy tax breaks that John Kennedy was going to put through before his assassination. They would be put through by Lyndon Johnson. And my father's taxes went from 90% to 70%, and he raised my allowance from $1 to 5 I was in high school. <laughs> but he made a promise to me when I was 8 or 9, and he held to that promise when I was in high school by giving me a larger allowance. So he was a man who, you know, he gave me his word. He would live by his word. And his sense of humor never left him. And to look back and think about the humorous times that we would have together, and at the worst times, he brought out the humor to make everybody always feel at ease. Whether when he had Alzheimer's, the letter, or any place else, he, he made us feel at ease being around him because he knew that people would be nervous being around him. I mean, take the day of the assassination attempt, March 30th, 1981. I'm in my office in not Beverly Hills, but in the San Fernando Valley. Secret Service agent walks in and says, there's been an assassination attempt to father's father. And he walks out of my office. And I just had an inner feeling that things weren't that great. I called the White House, asked for Nancy. She wasn't there, so I knew things weren't great. We would be on a plane late that night to fly back to Washington, spend the night at the White House at 10 o'clock the next morning. I would go in to see my father there at the hospital, George Washington University Hospital. And I'd walk in to see my father, who came very close to death, within a half an inch of his heart. Had they gone to the White House instead of the hospital, he would have bled to death. And I walk in to see my father, and I say, good morning, Dad, how are you? He said, well, you know, yesterday I was shot. <laughs> I said, yes, Dad, we know that. Everybody in the world knows you were shot yesterday. Well, if you're ever going to get shot, don't be wearing a new suit. <laughs> And I said, why are you telling me this? Well, yesterday, you know, I was shot. And I said, yes, Dad, we know you were shot. Well, I was wearing a brand new suit. First time I'd ever worn that suit. And I am the president. You think they let me undress, but no, no, no. Last time I saw that suit, it was in shreds in the corner of the hospital where they actually cut that suit off. I said, well, my gosh, uh, I'll tell Colleen that this is never going to happen to me. I'll wear an old brown suit maybe. Well, I'm just telling you. He said, that young man who shot me? I said, yes, John Hinckley? Well, yes. I understand his parents are in the oil business. I said, well, yes, they are. Well, I understand they live in debt. Well, yes, they do. Well, do you think they have any money? I said, well, the oil business, Denver, they got to have money, Dad. Why? Well, do you think they'd ever buy me a new suit? <laughs> well, they never did. That's all they ever wanted was a new suit. I used to scare the hell out of people on radio doing that. I, I did that one time when he was after after he was uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I did an interview with my father on the radio, with me doing both sides of the interview. And the next day, I got a call from my father's office saying, "You know, you can't talk to your father on radio. We have a blackout on that." I said, "What are you talking about?" Well, yesterday you had him on the show. You talked to him about Hillary Clinton and many other people. He answered those things. He's not supposed to be doing radio. ABC called, NBC called, CBS called, CNN called, and they want interviews with your father because they heard him yesterday on your radio show. And I said, you're kidding. And they said, no, we're not kidding. How did you get a hold of him? Well, I called the house and he answered the phone. He's not supposed to answer the phone. Nancy answered the phone. Well, she must have been indisposed. Well, he's not supposed to be answering the phone. If he does that again, just hang up. And I said, well, wait a minute. He, I said, I think he liked the interview. I said, why do you say that? He said, well, let me ask. Dad, what did you think of the interview yesterday? Well, Michael, I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> and the office then just fell off the phone and went, oh, my God, what has happened here? So they explained to NBC, ABC, CBS, it was Michael doing both sides of the Ronald Reagan interview on his, on his radio show. So I, I used to have fun. With, with all of that. You know, if you, uh, if you ever read my father's diaries, I don't know, many of you might have read them, and you go to April 12, 
1987. You see, he writes in there, uh, we were celebrating Ashley's fourth birthday at the, uh, at the ranch. And he talks about Michael talking to him about things that happened in his life and why he's been so angry and why he's acted in the way he has acted towards the family too often. Basically, at the end of it, Mike's back. If you ever read that, what he's referring to is what I write about today and you have in your book in front of you, Twice Adopted. I told him about being sexually abused when I was eight years old by a camp counselor. Being made of child pornography before I was nine. Having photographs taken of me and having me develop the photographs. And that I have always felt that I've done something terribly wrong and didn't deserve to have the Reagan name. And always worried that if those photographs had come out, they would have ruined his political career as governor or as president of the United States of America. And people would have seen me for the lie that I felt I had been living since the time I was eight years old. I deal a lot with, with abused children in foster care and speak to groups of that nature on, on a regular basis also. But that's a story I told my dad on April 12, 1987, because I had a book coming out called On the Outside Looking In. The book originally was going to be a book to blame Ronald Reagan, Nancy, and Jane for all the things and all the troubles I had lived through through all of my life. I had gone through fifth grade twice, junior in high school twice, I had dropped out of college, didn't have a steady job, didn't really want to be successful because I worried that success would bring the photographs out and people would see them. I worried about many, many issues that a child who had been sexually abused does deal with on a regular basis. About one in six males, one in four girls are sexually abused in their lifetimes. There's 400,000 kids today taken out of their homes because of neglect and abuse every single year. And that's what I told them that day. It's the first time in my life I came clean and told them. And I remember that day because it was interesting that when I used to ride out to the ranch with Nancy and Dad as a young boy, when I was six and seven, I used to sit on Nancy's lap going out to the ranch. And she would, and by the way, ladies, you know this, but there's not a man in this room who will disagree with me. Nancy used to put her fingernails right between my shoulder blades and rub my back on the way out to the ranch. I would sit there for eternity. And there's not a guy in the world who won't sit there for eternity when a young woman or his wife scratches the middle of his back between the shoulder blades. You know what I mean? And when she got pregnant with Patty, big pregnant, I could no longer sit on her lap, so I went to the back seat. And after what happened to me happened to me, and I became a very angry, angry man. That never would happen again. But the day that I was telling my father about what had happened to me as a child, I was standing there looking at my dad's boots and his belt buckle. Colleen was on my right. Nancy was on my left. We were standing out by Lake Lucky. Nancy's right hand was right between my shoulder blades. And I was not an old guy in 1987, but I was back being six, seven years old, and she scratched my back between my shoulder blades as I told my father and Nancy what had happened to me as a child and why I had been so angry. And it really changed my life because for the first time, what was happening is I was being honest with everybody in the family why I was the way I was. But you know, that was 1987. And and it was interesting, I know there's probably nobody in this room this, or in this outside here, there's probably none of you who have ever tried to make a deal with God. I am probably the only person here who has. But I remember going to church and it's still kind of blaming my family, blaming my parents. None of this would have happened had I been someplace else in my life. And I remember making a deal with God. My deal with God was, God, if you can get my father to tell me he loves me, I will serve you. And God talked to me that day, and I, probably the first time I ever listened to him. And, and God said to me, so Michael, when was the last time you told your father you loved him? And I realized, this is now 1990, I realized I had never told my dad in all of my life that I loved him, but I knew I loved him, but never told him I loved him. And God said to me, the next time you see your father, you tell him you love him, and you give him a hug for me and you. And so I said, okay, God, I'll follow through with that one. I was doing my radio show, a local show then, in San Diego. 
And my father came down to San Diego to be interviewed by me on his book, An American Life. And I went out to meet my father in the green room. By the way, green rooms are never green. They're just called green rooms. And I went up to my father, and I put my arms around him, scared the hell out of him. I mean, he looked at the Secret Service agents for protection. He thought he was being attacked by his own child. I put my arms around my father. I hugged him, and I said, Dad, I love you. You know what my father said to me? Well, I love you too. And I thought to myself, my God, all I ever had to do was say I love you, and you would have said that to me. And I have sat here for most of my life blaming you and saying the reason I am this or that is because you never said you love me? I felt about this small. And my dad and I began a relationship of hugging each other. Every time we would see each other, I would hug him alone, and I would hug him goodbye. He writes the letter in 1994 telling the world of this disease called Alzheimer's how he's going to disappear a little bit at a time. And we found that out as my sister Maureen would do puzzles with him. And the puzzle started at 500 pieces, and then went to 250, and then went to 100, and then went to 50, and went to 25, and 10. They would do puzzles together. Maureen never frustrated being able to spend time with her father. And I would see my dad, and every time I would see my father, I would hug him hello, and I would hug him goodbye. It wasn't long after the 1994 letter as we get deeper into the 1990s, my father got to the point where many in the family worried he didn't recognize them. He couldn't say their name. Nancy would try to help, Dad, this is Patty, this is Ron, this is Michael, it's Colleen, and so on. But my father, I had hugged him so many times, hello and goodbye, that when my father would see me, Nancy really wouldn't have to say this is Michael, even though she did. Because when my father saw me, his heart and his mind told him, this is the guy who hugs you, open your arms. And I would run into his arms. And I would hug him for love. And then I would hug him goodbye. And it was like this for a couple of years. Hug him hello, hug him goodbye. Him never saying my name, but just opening up his arms when he saw me. Or opening up his arms when I would leave. Waiting for that hug goodbye. There came a time, and it all happens to all of us, where you know you would go up and you would visit Nancy because you couldn't visit with dad anymore because he couldn't have a conversation. But you would go up there and visit with Nancy and give her conversation. And there's many other things that go on in our lives. But sometimes we get too busy to remember all the things we need to be remembered. One day while visiting with Nancy up at the, up at the house, Colleen and I, I said goodbye to Nancy, got up with Colleen, went to the front door, walked out to the car, and Colleen was getting in her side of the car and I was just opening up my side. And Colleen said, you forgot something. I said, what did I forget? She says, look at the front door. And I turned around and I looked at the front door of the house. And standing in the doorway of the front door of the house was my father with his arms wide open. He deep into Alzheimer's, had remembered that I had forgotten to hug him goodbye. I, Alzheimer's free, had forgotten to hug him goodbye. And he had gotten up when he saw my back turn in the den and head to the front door. He had had Nancy help him get up, and he took those little tiny baby steps all the way to the front door and stood there with his arms open. And I ran back to that front door, wrapped my arms around my father, and said, I love you. And he did what he always did. Couldn't say my name, but just gave me a little jerk with his arms to let me know he knew. 
I think about that moment when I think about the organization here at the AKC and what they're doing. You see, my dad stood in the doorway with his arms open to embrace me and say goodbye and say I love you. ADAKC will be standing and do stand in the doorway every day to embrace your loved ones now in the future to say we love you, we're here for you, we care about you. That's what they do. Nobody does it better in the community. They need your support. They need badly. But your loved ones need it even more. Please embrace them with the hug of my father, as they will embrace your loved ones with their love and the love of God. Thank you.